G'day Fools, I'm Scott Phillips, the Motley Fools Chief Investment Officer here in Australia and welcome to another, it's been a week already, that's right, another episode of Motley Fool Stock of the Week where we give you a look behind the curtain at one of our current Motley Fool buy recommendations from at least one of our services, sometimes it's more. Today, to give us our Stock of the Week, I introduce you to, again, to Andrew Leggett. G'day mate, how are you? Doing pretty well, Scott, doing pretty well. Excellent. Good to hear it. Mate, before I get into the stock, let me give the regular, I don't, I don't want to call it boilerplate. It sounds like it's not worth listening to and you've got to kind of skip through it. Don't do that. Here's what I want to tell you about Andrew's stock before he delivers it to you. The first thing is it's a buy recommendation right now, but that could change. Andrew could change his mind. I could change my mind. Any of the Motley Fool team could change their mind about this particular company. And if and when they do, we'll change the recommendation. It makes sense, right? So if you're listening or watching this anytime after early October 2021, just keep that in mind. It could have changed circumstances, valuation, anything could have changed. And we might change the recommendation. So make sure you get current recommendation advice from us before you act on the recommendation. That being said, we don't expect it to change anytime soon because we are long-term investors, which is the second thing I tell you every single week. That is, we don't know what's happening to the share price today, tomorrow, next week, next month, even next year. We're looking at three to five years and hopefully beyond and trying to find long-term business winners that translate into share price winners. We're not traders, we don't do short-term stuff here at The Motley Fool, largely, because we don't think it's possible, but uh, there you go. So this is a long-term recommendation. And lastly, as always, we can't give you personal advice, we can only give you general advice. So while we think this is a buy recommendation, we think you could and should buy this stock, I won't give it away just yet, uh, then uh, we, yeah, we don't know what your circumstances uh, require, uh, your risk tolerance, all that kind of good stuff. So. Andrew, thank you for sitting through that. It is super important. I don't apologize for doing it, but I know it's a bit of boilerplate for some people who've heard it every single week. If you are a regular listener or watcher, thank you very much. Of course, this episode is coming to you both on our podcast feed at Motley Full Money and through our YouTube channel. Just simply search Motley Full Australia on YouTube. And you can find that. There's all the great stuff there. Um, this Stock of the Week features stocks in focus, our favorite investment books. We do occasional deep dives into issues or topics. Andrew and I have got one coming up. Here's a, here's a red hot tip. I won't give it away just yet. Suffice it to say, it's one of the exciting parts of the market, something a lot of people want to, well, get their share of, no pun intended. Uh, so make sure you do uh, subscribe to our Motley Fool channel uh, on YouTube to hear that. But I'm gonna give one more plug because it turns out that in what is complete luck, complete, uh, what do they call it? Um, I don't know what they call it, circumstances. Uh, it turns out the company we're talking about today this episode comes out a day after the founder and former CEO of this company appeared on The Good Oil. So there you go, you're getting two doses of this company this week. If you've heard one, don't forget to listen to the other. So another gratuitous plug before we get into it. If you haven't yet listened to The Good Oil with Scott Phillips, the podcast that we produce, it's called With Scott Phillips because the boffins told me I had to put my name on it so people could find it on search. So I feel a bit embarrassed about that, but there you go. The Good Oil with Scott Phillips has Kate Morris who is the co-founder and former CEO of the company called Adore Beauty. Stock code is A-B-Y on the ASX. And that's the business you want to talk to us about, Andrew. So we heard Kate's story yesterday. We're going to do the company story. There'll be some overlap, of course, but hopefully uh, we won't get too far away from either. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be sitting side by side nicely. From your perspective, mate, tell us the story of Adore Beauty to now. I'm getting into the habit of like talking about companies just after you I uh, interviewed the uh, founder. We had that. Kogan previously. People are going to think this is, this is a complete setup, but this is, <laughs> I had no, I, I had no idea, you didn't. honestly. You didn't. <laughs> but, okay. But it worked out nicely. It, it did. Um, you know, more to talk about. Okay. Exactly. So Adore Beauty, like all good business stories, Adore Beauty mm -hmm. started in a suburban garage. Now, you know, that seems like a cliche, but it's a, a I think amazing. I they have to do that. They're the law. <laughs> How many like good businesses? Kogan was the same, obviously. Yeah. Apple, yeah. you know. Yes. Obviously, I, I okay. don't think Adore Beauty is going to be as big as Apple. I'll just put that right out there. But you know, <laughs> yeah, they no. do share some similarities in the fact they'll start it in a garage. Uh, yeah. So, as you said, founded by Kate Morris and a and a mm -hmm. guy by the name of James Height, they started Australia's first beauty e-commerce website. And today, that has today that first beauty e-commerce website is now Australia's number one pure play online beauty retailer. And that what does that mean? That means it currently has over 818,000 active customers 
They sell over 11,000 different products across 230 brands. And in the last financial year of 2021, they generated $179 million of revenue. So Mm -hmm. from humble beginnings, they've turned into a pretty successful business and it's good to see. Those are some extraordinary numbers, mate. 818,000 Australians. It's one of those things, you know, I think we're kind of used to shopping physically, right? And so if you go to a Westfield or a, some other shopping center, you see people walk in and out of a retailer, and you go, oh, that looks busy. And I think it probably does. We don't really ever think about how many customers Woolworths has nationally, but we kind of realize that Woolworths is busy at our local shopping center. So we figure Woolies must be doing something right. And you can kind of extrapolate that to any one of those um, you know, physical retail chains that we kind of know and love or maybe don't love so much. But when you think about the number of customers some of these online retailers have, either the pure play guys or even the guys that are what they call omni-channel across retail, physical retail and online retail, they're massive. But if you think about that number, I've got, to, I've got to tell you, mate, before you mentioned it to us in some of our meetings, I want to say maybe three, maybe six months ago, I can't remember exactly how long ago, I'd never even heard of the company. And when you think 800,000 Australians are shopping there, it's a reminder that the online world is kind of, it's, it's, it's there, but it's not there, right? It's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. To have 800,000 of my fellow Australians doing that, I sound like a politician, my fellow Australians, 800,000 people doing that, I had never even heard of the company. It's kind of, you know, it is a different world, right? The, the, the retail world, the general online world, but the retail world in particular online, there can be a whole lot of businesses. I was going to say niche. This isn't niche. This is a, almost a million of us. Uh, but, but you know, in different sectors, different segments, you don't necessarily have to have heard of or even used this business. And it's quite a big one and doing doing really, really well. Not only are those sort of numbers big, my 179 million in sales, as you say, but also a really, really large growth number. I think they're growing it. Was it 30 or 50%? Something really massive year on year. Excuse me while I try and avoid sneezing while we're doing the uh, the podcast and the, and the YouTube video. Uh, you know, growing at a rate of knots as well. So it's not just big, not just the biggest online pure play, as you say, but a business that is growing really, really nicely still. Yeah, and it obviously plans to grow, you know, for some time yet. They've been quite open about, you know, having mm. a growth strategy. And what you said about not, you know, a retailer that you may not have heard of, that it's mm. one of those kind of biases, like we know what brands we use. Yes. And, yes. you know, some other especially on online ones because at least with mm. bricks and mortar retailers you might see the brands when you're walking through the shopping center right, you walk past it an, exactly yeah yeah an online only website you yeah. might not know if you don't use it and obviously and I, I don't think i'm being kind of controversial here scott but i don't think you or even me are you know the the key target markets they do turns out products. turns out not so much <laughs> yeah, exactly. they, they do sell men's products. And after yeah, being in yeah. lockdown for a while, I think there's a few of us that may need some of those products from Adore Beauty. But, uh, you know, obviously the vast bulk of their customers are female. And therefore, if we're not actively looking at that industry or looking at who is or speaking to people that use their products, it's an easy one to not even know, especially that it's a business of such size. So that is, you know, like I said, it, it's an interesting thing. And it's, it's something that I like is looking for, looking for companies that may not, that are really, really good, but may not be in the eyes of everyone. And that, you know, a, a business that's easy for your average investor mm. to look over, mm. maybe because of its product category or who its customers are and the fact that they don't use it. And things like that and i i encourage people to look for those opportunities because they're around and if the market's not looking at them it could be a great opportunity there you go an investing lesson as well as a stock of the week two for one here on stock of the week this week from the motley fool mate um so we've talked about the business we've talked about the fact it's the largest pure play retailer but that in and of itself says well it's not the only one out there also we say talk about pure play but we're not talking about the rest of the retail market which is enormous i'm sure for beauty products, we're talking cosmetic, skincare, that kind of stuff. For those who are wondering how we kind of classify beauty products, it's not exactly only that, uh, but that's a large part of it. And I have to say, I was at the chemist only this morning, uh, picking up some vitamin E cream of all things. I managed to get myself sunburn over the weekend. That's a whole different story. Uh, but uh, I bought just the, the, you know, the everyday vitamin E cream. I was like, I don't want the brand stuff. Just give me the, give me the straight, the straight vitamin E cream. But I walked through because I'm not very, uh, not, I don't shop there very often. I walked through aisles and aisles and aisles of beauty products, and it's a reminder of exactly as you say how many products are in this category, how complex the business is. I can only imagine the challenges of trying to run an online beauty retailer with that many products, that many suppliers, that many categories. 
And yet they do it really well. They are the biggest, as you say, pure play. But that's not necessarily in and of itself a great investment. Now, it turns out we do think it is a great investment. That's why it's a buy recommendation. That's why you're talking about it this week. But it's not necessarily the case, right? The big is always great in terms of an investment, whether it's because there's no growth left, whether it's because even big growing businesses can be unattractive investments because they just don't create enough profitability. What is it about a doors business specifically? We know the big numbers, but why does it still represent a great investment opportunity in your mind, mate? Okay, so I'll summarize the bull case right here. So the beauty and personal <laughs> care industry in Australia is it's, it's a huge and growing market. It's mm. forecast to be worth around, I think, $11 billion by 2024 or something. So that, that's, a, that's a big figure in itself. Yeah. Now, the Door Beauty is only an online retailer, unlike some of its competitors that do both bricks and mortar and online. But online sales in this category are growing faster than the overall market. So currently around 11% of sales in the beauty and personal care market occur online. Now, if we look at what's happening in the US and UK, who are typically you know, a couple of years ahead when it comes to uh, online retailing, they're currently at around 17 to 80% respectively. So you know, that kind of gives, also points out that not only is the online sales of these products growing at a faster rate, that is obviously leading to online sales becoming a larger and larger portion of that overall mm -hmm. market. Now, if a door just stays where it is, and they've got around 13% market share of the online beauty and personal care market at the moment, then obviously they will benefit from that growing market itself. But mm -hmm. I also think that it can increase market share from here as well, which means that on top of that already faster growth, it will get further growth from going forward. So mm -hmm. What will help Adore Beauty grow and achieve that? I think for me, it's the really strong focus on the customer experience. Now, when I look at retailers, I typically try to look at it from, you know, what are they offering customers in regards to uh, product, price, convenience, and experience. Now, those four things, you know, differ in importance from industry to industry, but overall, when you really knuckle down to why people buy stuff, from a retailer, it mm. falls into a a mixture of those four those four elements. So, what Adore Beauty has going for it, and what kind of got my attention initially is it obviously has a wide range of products. We said before it sells around 11,000 11, products across two hundred and thirty brands. These include some of the most popular brands in the market, so the ones mm. that people are going to want to buy most frequently. Uh, so that helps in one way because it turns Adore Beauty into a, a one-stop shop for all beauty and personal care needs. And I think it's important to stress that Adore Beauty is not just a makeup business. Mm. It does sell cosmetics, but also sells skincare, hair care, body products, wellness products, you know, men's products products in the men's category as well. It mm, is yeah. actually covering the whole spectrum of products that fit in that beauty and personal care market. And that's, I just wanted to stress that because I think its name is Adore Beauty. It's easy just to think <laughs> that, you know, okay, so it's a place that sells lipsticks, makeup, eyeshadows, right, all of right. that stuff. It is, it is far more than, it is far more than that. So mm. there's a really big choice. It's also an official reseller of its products, meaning that customers can be confident of the product quality that they're getting. And there are some there are some custom there are some companies out there that aren't official resellers in you know all sorts of aspects of you know the beauty and fashion retail markets, and they do things differently by getting not directly from the brands but through other kind of you know grey market channels. The issue is that you can't always be sure that what you're getting is authentic and what you're getting is going to be in, you know, is going to be of sufficient quality. So that's kind of summing up the product side. It also has the most generous delivery terms in its market, which is important for online <clears throat> retailers. When people buy stuff, they want to know that they will get that as quickly as they can. Mm. And Adore offers the best terms in regards to uh, same day dispatch. So you can order on their website up till 4 p.m. And 
if you do that, then it will be dispatched on that same day rather than the next day, which reduces the time it takes to obviously get to you. It also has the lowest hurdles and it also has the lowest delivery prices, but also the lowest hurdles for free delivery compared to compared to its competitors. So that means that customers are saving money. And again, it just makes the delivery, you know, process a lot easier and less of a burden and, you know, far more of a positive experience than what may happen elsewhere. Also what Adore Beauty does and it's, and it's famous for is sending Tim Tam biscuits to every customer <laughs> who, who orders from them. Now, this personal touch, it may be a small thing and it's, it's something they don't need to do, but you know, just something that tiny can have a huge impact yeah. on building rapport with the customer and just saying, Hey, you know, we care about you. We want you to be happy. Here's your product. Here's a little treat to go along with it. Enjoy yourself, you know, and we look forward to seeing you again soon kind of thing. And that's, it's, that's also a touch, which I'll speak a little bit more, a little bit later on is something that's really got my attention. I, I like it when businesses don't just focus on the big things, but they also think of these little small ways that make it stand out compared to other people in the market. Like I said, mm. Adore Beauty does not need to send Tim Tam biscuits. Now that it started, <laughs> exactly. people may miss it, but yeah. they, they didn't need to start doing that. No one would have got yeah. upset saying, hey, why aren't you sending me a Tim Tam when I order? Mm -hmm. You know, no one else does it, but it's just, it kind of sums up the overall ethos, the personality of this company, which is something that's worth paying right. attention to. Um, so all of that on top of, you know, like Kogan, who we spoke about before that, you know, smart use of data to ensure that customers see the most relevant products for them. So they don't have to, you know, spend as much time trying to find what they want or they, th that product discovery, finding products that they may also like, you know, gets put in front of them a lot easier and it just makes the whole shopping process, this simple, enjoyable experience, you know, it's also building leadership in the industry through like media and educational content. They do podcasts, they do videos. They've got a really popular social media feed. All of this is also helping build and build its brand awareness and increasing again, that customer rapport to your brand and saying, Hey, so customers go, Hey, I want to shop from a door rather than insert competitor name here. <laughs> And that's kind of cemented a door's position of leadership. And I think has put it in a situation where it should help it grow market share in the future, like I said, but also set itself up for further growth in the future. Now, one final point, um, again, you know, talking about the personality of the business and the things like the Tim Tams, it's being run by a team led by CEO, Tanil O'Shaughnessy and, and the founders, Kate Morris, who you've mentioned, James Height, both mm. of whom own 10% of the business. So there's skin in the game there as well, which we always like to see. Um, mm. it, it's creating a company that has a clear and ambitious vision for what they want to achieve and, you know, a strong focus on ensuring it is, you know, for lack of a better term, a corporate force for good, you know, with a focus on sustainability and diversity. Again, this may seem completely pointless. But these are some of the characteristics that you see with great growth businesses these days. They don't just want to grow and monetize and make money, but they have this clearer, you know, this clear ambition. Now, David Gardner, co-founder of The Motley Fool, refers to it as, you know, conscious capitalism. And mm. it's worth paying attention to because these, again, they don't have to have this. They could just set the goal, hey, we want to make the most market in this industry as possible. But if you want to be take on this larger purpose, you kind of have to build a, a, you know, a successful company, because if you're losing money, if you're not growing, you can't right. focus about things like sustainability. You're just worrying about keeping that business, you know, keeping mm -hmm. that business running. So I like that. I can see that as well. And all of this, you know, I'd have to say the thing that impresses me most 
about Adore Beauty is all the intangible elements, most of which I've mentioned here, because, you know, that's where I often find the best opportunities because anyone can look at numbers and there's supercomputers that can pass that, <laughs> those numbers and data within an inch of its life to find whatever insight is lurking with them. But that intangible side, that thing that that's what creates great companies. And it's still relatively early days for Adore, but I like what I'm seeing. And I do think that that correlates with a successful business moving forward. Very nice, mate. You've done a lovely job of summarizing why we like the business. I will ask you about the risks in a second because we always make a point of sharing both the upside and the potential risks whenever we do a recommendation. Before we do, I'm going to take a quick detour, do a quick ad. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, listening to this sorry, episode on the Motley Fool Money podcast, thank you. We appreciate it. Why don't you check out the YouTube channel, Motley Fool Australia. Just literally Google Motley Fool Australia YouTube or go to youtube.com and type in the Motley Fool Australia. You'll find us there. You can check out this video a whole heap more. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, including hitting that notification bell and make sure you get more good stuff because there's stuff coming out about three times a week at the moment, maybe even more regularly moving forward. But let's say, well, let's just get that under wraps for a little bit, at least three times a week from now moving forward. Of course, if you are watching this on YouTube, thank you very much. Do make sure you check out our podcast, the Motley Fool Money podcast. Mate, we're coming to almost 500 episodes by the end of this year, I was told the other day. So that's pretty cool. We've been around for a few years now getting up to 500 episodes. And of course, the good oil with Scott Phillips that I mentioned earlier. Again, it sounds strange. It feels weird referring to myself in the third person, but there you go. The good oil with Scott Phillips is the name of the podcast. Check that out. Do subscribe to that one. Andrew's already mentioned we chatted about Rosalind Kogan. We had him on the podcast. Kate Morris on the podcast. We had people like Stephen Kukulis, The Economist, Eliza Owen, The Property Analyst, uh, Head of Research of CoreLogic Australia. Really great experts, entrepreneurs, and executives is our kind of core Reason for being at The Good Oil, um, plenty more episodes to come. Lots of great conversations lined up. So do do check that out as well. If you're on the socials, make sure you go to Twitter. Uh, we're recording this on the day that Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram are down, by the way. So that's kind of funny. So start with Twitter. At Andrew Leggett is where you can find Andrew's good stuff. He posts pretty regularly. It's some really good stuff too. At Andrew Leggett. I'm at TMF Scott P. You can grab The Motley Fool Australia. Just simply go at The Motley Fool AU. If you're on Facebook, when it's back up, The Motley Fool Australia is the uh, Twitter handle. So facebook.com slash The Motley Fool Australia or facebook.com slash Scott Phillips Money. You can get me there. I post some regular bits and pieces, mostly about investing, not always. So it's a bit, a bit of a hodgepodge, but at least consider yourself warned. All of our great content all over the place, all over those channels. Not yet on TikTok, despite Andrew's urging. I'm not sure we have a TikTok offering just yet, but you never know. Maybe that's one for 2022, we'll find out. All right, let's put all that aside, mate. Let's get onto the risks of an investment in Adore Beauty because every investment, no matter how confident, no matter how good, brings risks with it. Doesn't mean we don't invest in companies with risks, otherwise we wouldn't invest in anything, but it's worth knowing what we're investing in, what the upsides are that you've been through, and also why things mightn't turn out well or why we might eventually decide to sell an investment recommendation. So let's go with Adore Beauty's risks, mate. What are some of the things that our listeners and viewers should be keeping in mind if they are to buy shares in the company? Well, the first one and probably the main one to mention is competition. Like I said, it is the largest pure play online retailer. That means that there are others. There's also a lot of really established names that are not pure play online retailers and some of which may be you know, actually larger than Adore Beauty, but because they're not pure play, they don't get to call themselves the, the largest pure play <laughs> right. online retailer. Exactly. So, you know, exactly. companies like Sephora, you know, mm. Sephora is the first one that stands out. Now, this is a global powerhouse in the beauty and personal care market. It is mm. owned by a, you know, a company that, you know, may do some great things one day called Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy. You know, they have just they? a couple of like really impressive <laughs> yeah. brands that they yeah. that they kind of sell, yeah. um, you know, and own. So the and you know the the person who kind of controls that business just happens to be one of the richest guys in the world. So kind of gives a bit of an example there as to the mm -hmm. size and power behind that name. If you didn't already understand when I said the names Louis Vuitton, uh, there's also the local equivalent of Sephora Mecca, uh, who, which in itself has also been extremely successful. But then you throw in companies like David Jones, Maya, even Chemist Warehouse and Priceline, mm. Woolworths as well. You know, they all sell 
products in this market and you know th just shows competition is fierce and this is why i think the tiny things that adore beauty does to ensure the best customer experience matters as it's not always possible for them to lead on price and mm -hmm. you know that's obviously going to be a, a, a big impact so you know there's a lot of companies trying to take a slice of this pie and there will be more in the future and mm -hmm. you know as such there's it's always going to be you know a bit of a fight for a door to to succeed and do what i think it can do and continue building market share so that's the biggest risk because competition is going to have a huge impact on what a door looks like in the future now also on top of that the door beauty is a retailer and retailers are prisoners to the whims of the wider economic climate. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. There's little a door beauty or any retailer can do if some type of difficult economic situation, a recession, a downturn, whatever you want to call it, the same thing that, mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, the people who've been predicting one for like 80 years, they'll be right at some point. <laughs> exactly. And when that comes, often customers will zip up their wallets and that means less sales. And mm -hmm. retailers have high fixed costs when sales decline mm. profitability can get absolutely hammered because mm. the costs stay the same whether they're you know earning a hundred million dollars or 20 million dollars and mm. Mm. you know obviously if you know one thing stays fixed and the other is declining then there is a an a magnified impact on that so mm -hmm. there will be some bumps and volatility in the share price. You know, I do expect this would smooth out over time, but you know, like all retailers, it's not going to be just this straight kind of up and to the right experience that a lot of, a lot of investors kind of see. And the final thing I'll talk about is, uh, Adore Beauty is a recent IPO. It hasn't, you know, therefore it. We haven't got a huge amount of data on the company and its operations uh, at the moment. It's also, you know, I think trying to adjust to the difference in operations of being a private versus public company <laughs> that can lead to some to some situations where there's increased volatility as well. Um, like I said I'm not I'm not focused or worried about that, but for mm -hmm. those that you know, and a lot of investors do care about the you know, the shorter term kind of fluctuations of the share market that, you know, again, just like what I said with retail, you're going to expect some bumps on the road, you know, over this time. And, you know, it's really just about owning a company that you believe can succeed over the long term and giving them yeah. enough time to do that. So those that's basically summing up the risks. Like I said competition is the most obvious one and it's the case for every retailer in the world uh mm. because obviously you know you're trying to kind of succeed in a market where everyone else is and people you're just reselling stuff rather than owning although adore beauty is looking to get into the market of you know private label products so selling their own branded products but mm. you know when you're just reselling others other people's products not only are margins typically thin but you know, there's a lot of stuff that competitors can do, suppliers can do, you know, all of that, that can make your life far more difficult than if you were, say, <laughs> going back to an earlier example, Apple and just yeah. happen to own yeah. the most dominant kind of device in your market and you can charge, you know, obscene money and people will just pay it. dollars. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, that's right. There's, um, you know, what I do like about it, I will say, but a quick editorial is, um, because you, as you mentioned, the number of brands, the number of products, if you're a, I mean, to some degree, like this, it was not Apple, right? But if you're an Apple customer, you've got an Apple phone. And so, you know, if you're a retailer of, of, of handsets, you buy an, an Apple device or a Android device from one of maybe four or five dominant makers. And so as a retailer, you don't really add a whole heap of value necessarily. And as a, um, as a consumer, you don't really need the retail experience to kind of guide you down that. 
as I said, look, I'm, you mentioned at the top, I'm not a consumer of this, this category necessarily at all. Um, and as I'm walking through this, I'm, I'm not typical, but even then as I'm walking through the aisles, I was at a price line this morning and I'm kind of going, man, there's a lot of stuff here. Just where's the vitamin E cream? Now, again, in-store experience, very different, but I can imagine if I'm a consumer of beauty products or, or as I say, the general, the general category, skincare, the whole lot that comes with it. And I'm like, I don't know what I want. And you think about the number of brands, the number of products, the number of applications and, and, and rationale for different things. It does come out, I think, up to a large degree where a door has a really nice position is you're, you're the trusted partner, right, in trying to actually navigate that category. You know, you simply don't need if you're selling phone handsets or most other things, right? Selling baked beans, you probably choose between Heinz and SBC at the shelf. All these isn't really helping you all that much. You do it online, you do it offline, who cares? But I've got to say, you know, if, you, if you're consuming products or shopping for products in this category, um, it really does help to have a retail brand that actually does matter, does not necessarily set you aside because those brands are available elsewhere. But I can absolutely imagine that navigating that shopping experience is its own, is its own challenge. And if a door can become, you know, part of that shopping journey in a way that helps people do it easier, better, more effectively, that's got to be a win, I imagine, for a door. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. This is where, like I said, the small things that it does to, you know, build for itself this image of a trustworthy kind of retailer that wants to help, that doesn't just want to sell them the product, but sell them the right product and make sure that that customer has the best experience possible. That's yeah. probably more important in this market, I feel, than saving 10, you know, a couple of bucks to 10 bucks yeah, or whatever right. the price may yeah. be from buying it, you know, somewhere else. And, you know, I think what, you know, Tanil and Kate and James have created at uh, Adore Beauty is, you know, is, is very, very good. And I think it would have struggled to have got to where it is today otherwise. And, you know, I, 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 I think that culture is one of its biggest assets because anyone can start a retailer, but that, that culture is what helps it stand out from its competitors, you know, and some of them, like I said, your Sephora's, your Mecca's, these are not tiny companies that they're competing against. All right, mate. So you've summarized the risks nicely for us. A bit of editorializing for me, but let's get down to the tin tacks. Let's leave our listeners and viewers with a power 60 seconds. They've heard all about the company. They've heard about what it does, why you like it, what some of the risks are. Let's leave them with 60 seconds of an elevator pitch, mate. If you're going to say to our viewers and listeners right now, here's why you should consider buying shares in Adore Beauty. What are you going to leave them with, mate? Okay, so Adore Beauty is another Aussie e-commerce success company. From a suburban garage, it's become the one of the biggest players in its market, in and its market is a large and growing market. I believe it can continue to gain more market share, and thanks to its strong focus on building the best and most convenient online experience for its customers, that culture that we've been talking about, mm. I think it's well placed to, you know, be a to continue being even more successful in the time ahead. And in doing so, its share price should follow because share price over time follows business performance and therefore would make a great addition to an investor's portfolio. Beautiful. Nicely done, Andrew. Like, before I let you go, mate, do you own shares in Adore Beauty? No, no, I, I don't at the moment. Beautiful. Neither do I. So there's the disclosures out of the way. Adore Beauty, the code on the ASX is ABY. A business well and truly worth checking out. Of course, after you've checked out the Good Oil podcast, one last plug because, you know, got to get that in while I can. Mate, thank you very much for sharing Adore Beauty with us. Thank you for bringing it to The Motley Fool. You were the guy who thought of the idea up front and to the extent in our services, you're the, you're the brains and the the uh, effort, the sell story behind that. You bought us a company that I think, as you do, has a very, very bright future ahead. All right, folks, well, that's it for this Stock of the Week. Do make sure you check us out on those other channels. And until we see you next time, full on.